Hello and welcome to another introductory statistics video. We are continuing in this video to talk about hypothesis test, this time for proportions instead of for means, and this one should be a lot shorter and a lot sweeter. Hopefully you are ready with your formula card, your calculator, and your lecture notes for this section, and we'll just jump right in. So. Again, we're going to go through the five-step process, this time for proportions, and each of these steps is very similar to before. That's why we get to go a lot faster, but it is a little bit different. It's a little bit tweaked to be for proportions instead of for means. And I should start off by saying that proportions are really for non-quantitative data, categorical data. So if we've got quantitative data, it's better to do a means test. So it's better to talk about the mean and to hypothesize about the mean. Um, if, though, we don't have quantitative data, we can't do a means test. We've got categorical data. The only test we can do is for proportions. So that's what this is really for, proportions. And uh, so we've got two assumptions here. And you'll notice that the first assumption is exactly the same as before. And you'll notice that all pretty much every hypothesis test you do we only do two types in this course so we only do the means and the proportions but there are dozens of different hypotheses tests that you could do and if you take an advanced statistics class you certainly will do them uh, the only one that's really um, consistent the only assumption that's consistent throughout is that you need randomness you need your sample to be completely in a hundred percent random in order for all of this stuff to be true. Uh, and so we have the simple random sample assumption, which remember involves having data that was collected um, where you've numbered your entire population from one to whatever, not just a subset of your population, not a convenient sample of your population, but the entire population you've numbered from one to however many there are in the entire population, and you've used a random number generator to choose which parts of your population are going to be in your sample. So if it doesn't have those things, it's not truly random. And so we should test everything that we do by that measure. Um, and then if you're reading a study, you should go and find out how they collected their data, because this is definitely the most violated um, thing for statistics, for hypotheses tests, for sure. Um, the second assumption is quite different. So we need a large enough sample size that the sampling distribution is approximately normal, but we need to specifically do this calculation um, to see if that's actually true. So remember, well, remember mu0 was the hypothesized mean in the last section. It turns out that p0 will be our hypothesized proportion. So whatever proportion we're going to use in our hypotheses, that's the number that goes here. And then this is our sample size, of course. So we're going to multiply our sample size by our hypothesized proportion. Um, and then we're going to find the complement of our hypothesized proportion, um, our hypothesized failure, I guess you could say. Um, and we'll multiply it by n as well. And both of these numbers need to be at least 5. Now, other textbooks will give you numbers that are much higher than 5. Um, the previous textbook we used said 15, 15 and 15, and I think the textbook before that said 15 as well. So 5 is pretty low, but that's what this textbook says, that's what Newton uses, and so that's what we're going to go with in this course. But be aware that other textbooks will have higher standards here. And so now what we want to do is let you do an example problem and then we'll work it together. So pause the video now and give me the assumptions and why or why not um, these assumptions are met in this scenario. So I'll let you pause now to do that. Okay, hopefully you have paused the video and I hope that you came up with yes and yes. Um, and I also hope that you came up with reasons because the problem said random sample, that's why we know that this one is yes, and so we'll assume that it is a truly random sample. We're not sure if it's simple or not. Simple would be preferred, uh, but we can probably waive this first assumption even if it is a cluster or stratified or systematic random sampling because all of those are legit as well. Uh, convenience is not a form of random sampling, so it would not be legit. Um, and then we need to know if the sample size is large enough. So we actually have to do the math on this. It's not um, terribly involved math, but we need to find n and we need to find p0. Our hypothesized proportion should be this 20% here because um, <clears throat> it's asking about 20% and we convert it to a proportion. So that's going to be 0 0.20. 
So um, 250 is our sample size. 250 times our P0 of 0 0.20 is going to give us 50, and you can use a calculator for that if you want. And then the complement of 0 0.20 is going to be 0 0.80. And so that is uh, 250 times 0 0.80. And these should add together to give us our 250 back. And they do. Um, so 250 together is 250. And both of these are more than 5. They could be equal to 5 as well. Um, but we're definitely good to go here because they're both more than 5. And we're good to go here because it said random sample. So hopefully that's what you came up with. And we'll move to step two of this process. So step two is getting our hypotheses and of course just like last time the researcher has a whole bunch of choices that they can choose from or the student should choose which most aptly represents the scenario that's being presented in the problem. And so you would choose which one of these and by default if none of them are given you would use the the two-sided test because it's the stronger of the two and then you would replace the alternative symbol with an equal sign to get your null hypothesis. Notice how these are all p's. Last time they were all mu's, mu's and mu zero. Well this time we're dealing with proportions not means and so everything is p's and not p zero. So I'm definitely going to be looking for you to use the correct symbol there and pretty much it's like last time other than changing the symbol from mu to p. And so uh, we will pause here and let you do your null and alternative hypothesis for this scenario. Okay, so here our null hypothesis, um, we are told 20% of Austin P students were exclusively online. And the question that's being asked is, has exclusive online enrollment increased? So has it become more? And so the question that's being asked usually points to our alternative hypothesis. Has it increased from its 20%? And for proportions, we of course always need numbers between 0 and 1. So even though these are usually given as percentage, and even though in our conclusion statement we'll put it back to a percentage, right here in our hypotheses, because we're using the words P, they have to be proportion. So definitely put that in terms of proportions, not percentage. Uh, so I'll be looking for that. I'll be looking for the correct symbol um, for the alternative hypothesis, and of course the correct symbol for the null, which here is equals, or you could have done less than or equal to. That would have been acceptable as well. Um, and then I will look for the P instead of the mu, and I will look for the correct labels on each of these. Uh, so that's the hypothesis for proportions in this scenario. And now we can move on to the more challenging steps three and four. Uh, so step three, we remember last time we had the sampling distribution of X bars. This time we have the sampling distribution of P primes, and that really should say prime there and prime there. And just like last time, we assume our null is true. So we assume that H0, which says that our proportion is P0, um, we assume that that's actually going to be true. Um, we compute our particular P prime for our scenario. Um, and uh, so if that's right here, then we would shade uh, to the left if we had a left tail test, or to the right if we had a right tail test. And remember, the tails are determined by the alternative hypothesis symbol. Oh, but we're getting ahead of ourselves because that's really more step four. Um, the z-score, we would want to compute the z-score based on our p-value. So we'll take whatever our p-prime is, our sample proportion is, um, and we'll use the mean of all of the proportions, which is the, from our hypotheses, uh, whatever our hypothesized value was. And of course that goes down here as well to, to get the standard error for our proportion, sample proportions distribution. So we'll compute all of that before we actually decide which way to shade. Um, that's, that's the next step. And uh, before we go to the next step, I'm going to pause and let you compute the z-score. So we'll actually compute the z-score here, and then we'll go to step three. So go ahead, and if you want to compute the z-score using the easy way, <laughs> feel free to do that too. Um, so that's going to be, uh, as your formula card says, 
for proportions, the hypothesis test for proportions, you can get both a z-score and the p-value for the one prop z test. And the z-score is step three and the p-value is step four. So I'll pause now to let you pause. Okay, hopefully you've paused and hopefully you've got that z-score. And so let me show you what I got. So using our scenario, we have 78 out of 250 is our sample proportion. So 78 divided by 250 is how many online, exclusively online students that we had in our sample, in our hypothetical sample. And then the problem asked us, and we did in step two, uh, get our hypotheses were um, using this point two zero. So everywhere you see P zero, we will have point two zero. And then 250 is our sample size. And so um, that's our denominator of the square root. Uh, and then you put it all in the calculator at one time and you will get, um, be sure to do parentheses of course here and be sure that all of this in the bottom gets under the radical. And I got 4.427. Uh, and I'm keeping four significant digits because I'm gonna use this in step four to get my p-value. So this is the by hand way. We'll go over the shorter way after we do step four by hand as well. Uh, so whether you did it by hand or by calculator, you should have gotten exactly this value if you didn't round anything that is. And then step four, this is not the actual picture. This is an example picture. It's not the picture for our scenario, I guess I should say. It is a real picture that is for a real p-value and a real z-score, um, just not our particular scenario that we've been doing. So the p-value, just like last time, it, the closer it is to zero, the stronger the evidence is. The farther it is from zero, the weaker the evidence is. So it summarizes our evidence and tells us how unusual this would be, assuming that the null is true. Uh, that we would collect data that we collect. And if it's very unusual, then we say, nope, the null's not true because this it just couldn't happen. Um, so it's very unlikely to happen. Uh, so we want to compute the p-value. Um, and hopefully you remember the chapter six magic that we do to find area of the curve if, we're, if we know the z-score. And so hopefully you remember that. And uh, if you don't, you could always use the easy way to compute the p-value, which is the one prompt z test. So let's pause now and give you a chance to compute the p-value on your own, and then we'll come back. Okay, so hopefully you've gotten a p-value, and this is what I have. So I drew a picture of my curve, because you know I like to draw pictures, and this is the by hand way. Um, so I drew a picture of my curve. My starting point was the 4.427 that I got from the step three. And so that's gonna be the lower limit. And then remember that our hypothesis said increased and so we had our alternative hypothesis symbol was greater than, and that means we shade the area that's greater than. Um, and so that means the maximum of my shaded region is 1E99, and the minimum is, of course, the 4.427. And then because it's the Z distribution, the mean of standard deviation of the Z distribution is always 0 and 1. So we can put those in as well when we do normal CDF, and when we do all of that, we get 4.78, except that we know that it can't be more than one because it's area of the curve, which is equal to probability. And so if we look closely, we realize, hey, that's e to the negative six, and so that means that we're going to go six units in this direction, um, and that will be uh, one unit and then plus five zeros. So one unit to capture our four and to put it before the, the decimal. And then, so we're gonna have a decimal and then five zeros and then four, seven, eight will be our p-value. So again, we have a really tiny p-value. Um, whoops, I wanted to actually do this before we move on to step five. I wanted to do this. Uh, on the calculator. So here is the by hand way that I did it on the calculator, but I wanted to actually use the one prop Z test. So stat test, and then option five is the one prop Z test. Our P0, our hypothesized proportion, 
was that 20%, and remember we have to give it as a decimal, and it's, I love how whenever you do a test, the very first entry that you do and the, the last significant entry that you do are both the alternative hypothesis. So this is the alternative hypothesis value, and this is the alternative hypothesis symbol. So you kind of always have those two things whenever you do any test. Um, and it's the first thing and the last significant thing that you do. Um, let's see, our X is our number of successes, so that's the 78. And then our N is the total sample size, which is the 250. Um, and then our alternative symbol was increased, so we changed that to increased. And then calculate. And we get exactly the same thing, don't we? Well, no, we don't. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, yeah, the z-score is exactly the same, but the p-value rounds to be the same thing if we only do three significant digits, but why is it different? I'll have to think about that. That's, did I do something wrong? I don't think I did. No, because I got the same z-score. That is interesting. Okay, um, hmm. yeah, okay, I was expecting for the p-value to be exactly the same, and it's not exactly the same. Okay, well, I'll, I'll harp on that later, um, and see, uh, if I can figure out why. Uh, but, essentially, when you round to the amount of digits and given the leeway, because Newton will give you enough leeway so that either the calculator way or the tables way, so certainly it would accept the, the normal CDF way or the, um, the calculator way. Uh, but I doubt it's ever going to ask you for enough significant digits to get a difference anyway. And so we know that we've got 0. 0.0000478 as our p-value. We want to take that and do the final step up. Yay! Um, so remember that if p is less than or equal to alpha, and alpha will be 0. 0.05 if it's not otherwise specified, then we reject because we reject when they're tiny p-values. And when they're big p-values, we when they're bigger than the alpha, we do not reject. Um, so when we do reject, we do have sufficient data to conclude all of this stuff is true. And really, all of this stuff is saying the alternative hypothesis. So we do have sufficient data to conclude that our alternative hypothesis is true. It's phrasing it in language that anybody can understand, but that's what this is saying. And then if we don't reject, we do not have sufficient data to conclude that our alternative hypothesis is true. So I will give you your scenario and uh, let you pause the video here and write out a conclusion statement and hopefully have all of the elements that I'm looking for when I go to grade the projects on these. Okay, hopefully you've paused the video and we will take a look at our conclusion statement. Remember our p was tiny again, and so we will again reject. Um, so since p was tiny, 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 less than alpha, um, we reject the null, and therefore we do have sufficient data to conclude that, um, and I rearranged some stuff here, but let me show you the alternative hypothesis symbol in words. Um, that's going to be right here. And so we can say increased, um, and that was our alternative hypothesis symbol in words. And then what percentage was it? Um, well, I did say 20%. Um, and those are both from the alternative hypothesis. And then uh, I want to give a description of my population. And that is all Austin P students. And I want to describe my category. And that is um, exclusive online enrollment. And then I have some, a little bit of extra stuff that kind of explains why we thought that the um, enrollment would change. So. Uh, since the, we have a p-value, we reject the null, and therefore we do have sufficient data to conclude that exclusive online enrollment for Austin P students has increased from the 20% we had before coronavirus. And so hopefully that all makes sense, 
and I wish you well as you go through the chapter and work on your discussions, homework, projects, and quizzes. Don't forget the formula card, especially the one prop Z test, because it's a lot faster on steps three and four um, in doing these problems than doing it by hand. You don't have to draw your picture. You don't have to wonder, do I use TCDF and normal CDF and all that good stuff. And then of course your calculator is a wonderful resource. Hopefully these lecture notes and video will be valuable to you as well. And then the textbook um, and the Newton instruction. Now they will probably tell you the slow way to do it. So um, that's why these are your most valuable resources. But if you ever get stuck on something, you can look um, at the just-in-time Newton instruction. I love how they do that. And the textbook, look stuff up in the textbook. And um, if you are unsatisfied with all of these, please, please, please message me and let me know what questions you have. I'm eager to help, especially um, for those who are working through all of these steps and have watched the video. I want to be here to help you. So good luck and I wish you well.